and Linda Ziedrich. Thank you all for coming. Our three speakers tonight all live in my neighborhood, but they've lived there a lot longer than I have. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. First, Sally Morgan was born in Lebanon 62 years ago and lives in the house she grew up in. Her grandfather served on the board that founded the Lebanon Hospital. Her mother founded the hospital gift shop, and today Sally herself takes great joy in supporting the hospital by volunteering at the registration desk, serving on the patient advisory council, and sitting on the board of directors for the hospital auxiliary. Ken Bolf's grandparents came to the Lebanon area in 1920 and lived on a 90-acre farm on Brewster Road. Ken became a high school English teacher and taught for more than 25 years in the Central Lynn School District. In his retirement, he is a landscape and wildlife photographer. Tony Hayden, a longtime photojournalist, was born in the Second Street building that used to be the public library and before that was the city's hospital. His parents were prominent in the community. They founded Kegal Radio Station and his father co-founded Hoodoo Ski Bowl and served as editor and publisher of the Lebanon Express for 35 years. Let's welcome Ken. Ken and Tony and I have known each other quite a while, and we do live within three blocks of each other, so we see each other. Okay, I'm going to start talking about my great great grandparents on my grandfather's side. Carl Carlson was born in Norway and immigrated to America. He lived in Minnesota until coming to Oregon. He married Josephine Nelson, who lived here in the Willamette Valley. Carl and Josephine applied for and received a land grant for property out by Saddle Butte. It is signed by President Grant, and there's a copy of it on the table over there if you'd like to see it. When the house became old and no longer able to live in, they built a new one to the west. The freeway project started, and the house was so well constructed that they were able to move it farther west. The freeway construction made a lake by the house. Carl and Josephine had six children. Victor, my grandfather, Olive, who worked for many years at Myron Franks in the drapery department, Ruby, in which I don't know much about because she died when she was young, Josephine owned, owned Moto Day Dress Shop in Albany, <coughs> Carl started Carlson's Hardware in Brownsville and is still family owned, and Albert was an electrician and owned Carlson's Electric. Grandma Ellie Fitzgerald was born and raised in Lebanon, graduating from Lebanon High School. She went to Oregon Normal School and got her teaching degree before she married Victor. When she was a teacher at Brewster, Grandma would catch the logging train at the uh, train station and ride with the uh, conductor until she got to Brewster. She got <laughs> off the train, taught, and then afterwards she would catch the train and come back into town. <laughs> Grandma and a fellow teacher named Alice worked in schools in Lebanon. Alice lived with her parents out in the country. She would stay with Grandma and her family in Lebanon during the school week. Alice invited Grandma to her place for the weekend. Alice and Grandma drove a horse and buggy to Alice's house. A man drove really fast past the, the buggy and kicked up dust. That man was Victor Carlson. <laughs> Victor married Allie Carlson in 1923. They moved to Portland where Grandpa went to Binky Walker Business College. On a visit to Lebanon, Grandpa was walking down the railroad tracks over by Harrison Street. He got to talk to a man who offered him a job as a truck driver for the Union Oil Company. That man was Jack Zibrick's father, John. Grandpa took the job and they moved back to Lebanon. He later purchased the Union Oil Company in Lebanon. The bill of sale was notarized by Lawrence Morley. Morley. The house where they lived and my mom and aunt were born is still on the northeast corner of Ashley Grove. After Grandpa retired, he bought a farm in Lacombe. It was 50 to 60 acres, and it was his hobby. The farm was split by Lacombe Road. The north property was always wild. The south property was uh, leased out. The house, I believe it is still there, was rented by people who uh, worked the farm. 
Grandpa had a sheep, had a sheep on a bit of acreage. One day, my brother John was at the farm. His sheep took after him, and John ran as fast as he could. The adults ran after John. I don't think John has ever eaten sheep, but I think he's still in therapy. <laughs> Uncle Elmer, Grandma's brother, was born in Lebanon also. He did not finish high school, but his business sense made him a success. Elmer opened a transferred service on Sherman Street, and there's a picture of the building over on the table. Later, Elmer opened Lebanon Sand and Gravel. The rock quarry was located on the east side of the river. The business was very successful. When Elmer wanted to retire, he sold the business to two men, and he said these men will never, ever make it in the business. The men were the Morris brothers. <laughs> Elmer was very active in the community. He was mayor, fire chief, fireman, Lions Club member, and Mason. Elmer married Jane. After Jane had a stroke, Elmer built her a house that had no stairs. It is still on Grove Street. My dad served in, war, in the Army in World War II. He was stationed in France as a mechanic. One day, Dad was fixing a tire on a Jeep, and the jack hit him in the head, and he got the Purple Heart. Dad sent it back, saying he wanted for somebody else to have it that deserved it. Mom and Dad met at OSU after the war. After they were married, they moved to Lebanon, where Dad went to work as a truck driver for Grandpa. Mom and Dad lived in an apartment that is still here. It is across the street from the pillbox. Mom was a housewife, a salesman for insurance. Why? A salesman for insurance kept coming to her door wanting to sell her insurance. She had finally had it, so the next time the salesman came, she came to the door. She climbed on top of the refrigerator where she, the salesman couldn't see her. <laughs> that happened a few times and he was gone. Mom belonged to the Thursday Night Bridge Club. Twelve women who got together once a month to play bridge. Our families were all close and did many things together. Growing up, we knew we had 12 mothers, and then I see Betty Adams is here, that's 13, in town, and we couldn't get away with anything. At the end of Ash Street was a large walnut orchard in a dirt road off of Ash. My grandfather bought part of the orchard. At the end of that street was an old house that was built in 1910. Mom and Dad bought that house in 1950. It had a pitcher pump and an outhouse. They burned the outhouse and updated the inside. The house was very small, but every time Mom and Dad had a baby, Dad would add another room. <laughs> the city wanted to put the street in, so Grandpa gave them the land for the street, and it was, was called, and he is called, Carlson Drive. Dad took over Grandpa's oil business when Grandpa retired. Dad had four gas stations and an oil delivery service. When the Union Oil Company moved their plant to another location, Dad became a contractor. He built the DMV, the Lebanon Animal Hospital, and many more. He also built many houses. The solar building was one of his most one he was most proud of. He was way ahead of his time. We had a great childhood. There were four children: myself and my brothers John, Joel, and Craig. Mom and Dad both thought that one of the best educations he could have was to travel. And boy, did we. In 1969, Mom and Dad filed us into a three-seater station wagon, two seats facing forward, and one rear is facing back. Off we went for our six-week trip around the United States. When we got to Walla Walla, Dad had to have enough. He got out of the car and put masking tapes down the back of the two seats and said, you stay on that side and you stay on that <laughs> side and we will be just fine. We did make it for six weeks. Dad and Mom bought a forest service cabin in 1963 at Marion Forks. No water in the winter, outhouse, no electricity. It was heaven. We spent as much time up there as we could. The cabin is still in the family. There was an infamous, infamous riot on Carlson Drive. The street had many children living there and many that visited. One night there was probably 15 or 20 of us playing in the street and a couple of kids went across to, crossed Ash Street and accidentally stepped on the lawn of a very mean man. The man was so upset he called the police. When the police arrived, the kids all scattered. We pulled my little brother over a fence into a yard to hide. We finally made it home. The police came to each of the houses and gave us lectures. 
Little did they know that we were hiding two children upstairs that did not live on Carlson Drive. <laughs> the next week in the Express was the, <laughs> was the headline, Riot on Carlson Drive. <laughs> Christmas at the Carlson's was a time that I will never forget. On Christmas Eve, we gathered at Grandma's house. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Aunt, Uncle, uh, Aunts, Uncles, Cousins. We had a Norwegian Christmas. Norwegian food included fruit soup, homemade chicken noodles, klanzakaki, which is a festival cake, and it's made out of almonds, and the bottom um, is a ring, and it goes up in the rings to the very top and it's decorated at Christmas, and you eat it by taking off the bog ring, and then the next ring, the next ring. And of course, there was lepsa, lots of lepsa, lots and lots of lepsa. Still to this day, it's my favorite dessert. Grandpa, when he was young, used to put lepsa in his back pocket to take to work as his lunch. There was always Santa Claus. One Christmas in the late 60s, we heard a sound coming from our house to Grandma's. The sound was on the lawn, Outside Santa, my dad, in full Santa Claus suit, came on a snowmobile to deliver all the presents. The snowmobile was a present to us so we could get into the cabin in the winter. My dad told us, oh no, how about me? As for me, I left for a few years to teach and to work as a social service director. I always knew I would come back to Levin and make it my home. My dad told us that if you live in a town, you must give back to the town. And that is still in us a spirit to give back. My grandfather was on the original board of directors for the hospital. Grandma and grandpa were in a terrible accident on Brewster Road where they hit a train at night. They were one of the first patients in the new hospital. Uh, he was also a Lions Club member, a mason, a volunteer fireman. He would belong to the Shriners. There's a little boy that lived in the country that had no ears. He could hear the blue flaps right there. And he got him into the Shriners Hospital and they gave him ears. And Grandpa was so very grateful for that. Um, and he also helped with the strawberry fair. Grandma was an OSU Women's President, Student Advisor for OSU Students, Priscilla Club, Washing Day Tea. Uh, in the old days, washing was done on Mondays, and I still try to do that. And with one month, one day a month, that all the women would get together and have a tea and make quilts for those people in need. Um, she was on the first board of the Lebanon Hospital Auxiliary, and she worked for the Strawberry Fair. Dad was on the school board and was chair of the school board, Lions Club member, volunteer fireman, was on the session of the Presbyterian Church, helped build Harden Hall at the church. He was a mason, an elk, and a strawberry. Mom was a 52-year member of PEO. It is an international philanthropic organization that earns money for the continuing education of women. <coughs> she was on, on the original board to develop the Lucille Eskelson Preschool. She founded the gift shop with two other women at the hospital, two sliding glass display cases, and a metal box to take the money. She volunteered at the hospital. It was on the auxiliary board. She was the deacon at the church, and she worked with the Strawberry Fair. Me, I was chair along with Warren Beeson of the original Star Spangled Celebration. I'm a 38-year member of PEO. I've been a hospital volunteer for eight years working at front registration desk. I've been six years on the hospital auxiliary board. I'm chairman of the Lebanon Dog Park Committee. I'm on the Accreditation and Family Patient Experience Council of the Lebanon Hospital, and I work for the Strawberry Fair. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the canal. As you drive through town, you cannot help to notice the winding, beautiful canal that travels through it. The canal started construction of a mill race in 1871. A small dam was built on the Santa Ana River just north of where River Park and the Grant Street Bridge are now. This supplied power to many businesses, including Elkins Flour Mill. In 1858, Thomas Monteith of Albany was planning to build a canal from the Santa Ana River to Albany. His idea was to use it for transportation via barges to ship farm products and lumber. The end canal would also have towpaths where teams of animals hauled barges upstream. 
after the completion of the canal, it was discovered that it ran too rapidly to allow towing barges against the current. Monteith continued to work on his canal in 1872. It took two years to build. 150 Chinese laborers from Portland hired to help build the canal. And the jug on the table over here are the water jugs for the Chinese. They use those. Um, these two were found, I'm not sure, by one of my uh, relatives in the bottom of the canal. In 1880, there was the establishment of a railroad to Lebanon, rendering the canal obsolete for transport, transportation. A group of Lebanon citizens invested $12,000 in the Lebanon Ditch Company to bring the water to the south end of Lebanon, fairly close to downtown. This required a dam across the San Juan, about two miles upstream from Lebanon at Cheetah Falls. The canal looks like a natural stream as it wanders through town because it follows a natural sloop. In 1883, an electrical generation plant was installed giving Lebanon electric streetlights long before most towns. There was a start, this was the start of the city water for both fire control and domestic use. The plant was enlarged in 1920, then again in 1946 to keep up with Lebanon's growing population. Grandma lived in Carlson Drive next to us. Uncle Albert lived across the canal for Grandma. Every Christmas he would put a good size stern wheeler decorated for Christmas, including Christmas lights, in the canal and tethered it on both sides. Throughout the season, the wheel would turn in the water and it would just stay there with its lights on. As kids, we loved the canal. We would catch products and have a feast. There were fish in the canal at that time. Having to wear tennis shoes, because we never knew what was going to be at the bottom of the canal, we would get into the canal at Grandma's house and swim or float to the draws. That as far as they let us go. We would climb out of the canal on the steps at Gerard's and run across the reeds in Graham's yards and start all over again. Not so long ago, I was standing watching, uh, standing watch on the, at the canal from the Ash Street Bridge. As I watched, I saw a whole family of beavers headed downstream. The canal is a special part for our city. I have one more story I'm going to tell you. My mom's name was Elmer Jane. E-L-M-E-R-J-A-N-E, -E, one word. She was named after my uncle Elmer and my aunt Jane. She did not like the name, <laughs> but when she got older, she embraced it. Well, my dad didn't like the name, so when they were in college, he called her Homer. <laughs> and I found a stack of letters and cards from my dad to my mom that were addressed to Homer. <laughs> well, Dad belonged to a fraternity, and Mom belonged to a sorority, and one basketball game, Dad and his fraternity were in bleachers, and Mom and her sorority walked in. Dad's fraternity stood up and said, Hotty toddy, what a body, Homer. <laughs> <laughs> and what's amazing is they still got married. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming tonight. asked me to uh, tell a bit about my family uh, history in Lebanon and a bit about growing up here. And so I dug into the family papers and I realized that as of the next year, 2020, uh, the uh, members of the Balt family will have lived in and or around Lebanon for 100 years as of next year from this December. Uh, my grandparents arrived here in 1920 and bought, uh, I double checked that, it's an 80 acre farm, pretty close, about 90 acres. Uh, yeah, uh, when I was doing a little bit of research uh, about that, on Brewster Road, and uh, I found that at one point or other, it was called Old Territorial Road. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Uh, I also found another reference that was referred to as, uh, is that a little bit better if I hold it closer? Yes. All right. Uh, Old, <laughs> <laughs> Old Market 
Oldemark wrote 24, and I couldn't find any dates to match up with either of the names, but I had never heard of either of those before. Uh, so for my grandparents, getting here to Lebanon was not an easy journey. Uh, Grandpa Paul was born in a tiny village in eastern Moravia, which uh, in 1918 uh, grouped together with a couple other countries to make Czechoslovakia. Uh, and so he was born there in 1876, and by 1888, when he was 12 years old, uh, his dad had passed away and all 11 of his siblings had passed away, only two of them that had reached adulthood, Paul himself and a sister by the name of Veronica, who lived to be 24. And uh, one of the things Czechoslovakians are known for is uh, not going too far away from home. Uh, but my grandpa talked uh, my grandmother, Mom, uh, to migrating to the United States. And so they arrived in Galveston and lived in uh, Malang, Malang County and Bell County uh, for several years uh, in central Texas. So in 1902, Grandpa and Grandma, whose parents met aboard a ship while immigrating, uh, that's when Grandpa and Grandma were married. And then they moved to a little town called Rogers. So for point of reference, about three hours due south of Fort Worth, Dallas. Uh, Rogers, at that time, has uh, had a population of 1,000. Rogers today has a population of 1,000. <laughs> uh, so they bought a farm there that they leased out for income, and they also bought a department store and took on a partner. And I found in some of the family papers that Grandpa uh, was very civic-minded, played a tuba, not a accordion, uh, tuba in the town band, uh, for one, and sometimes acted as sitting mayor. So if there's something genetic there, I guess I could help out Paul off and on. Uh, actually, some languages, too, that he picked up. Uh, English, uh, he picked up sign language, picked up the French language, picked up the German language. And uh, let's see if I can find my place here. Oh, so when my daughter and I uh, visited relatives in the Rogers area, summer of 2001, we took photos of ourselves uh, at Paul Street, named for my granddad, uh, in, which is the street he and his family lived on in the 19-teens. And we found the lot uh, on which they lived that couldn't determine if the old house on the property, you know, whether or not it was the, you know, the original house, you know, from back then. Uh, one fact I found of interest, uh, while they're still stuck in Texas before they've come up here, uh, in Rogers is how my grandparents decided which church to attend. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa preferred attending a Methodist church, but the closest one was about 18, 20 miles away, uh, while the Catholic church was just three or four miles away. So they chose to attend the Catholic church a matter of practicality, I guess, but I also found interesting that the choice of church was predicated on the location and how that trickled down through the family. Uh, that choice making a lasting impact on my dad, aunts, uncles, and a lot of their children uh, who maintained uh, being Catholic. So to move things along, uh, one Monday when Grandpa uh, went out to work at the store, he found that his partner uh, he had wiped him out, taken all the goods, all the cash. Uh, into our knowledge, the guy was never caught. So it was kind of like, now what? Uh, and Grandpa and Grandma had several Czechoslovakian friends who had moved here to Lynn County. And in their correspondence, uh, they had told my grandparents about the mild climate, uh, the fertile soil, and so on. And so in 1920, Grandma and Grandpa, along with her seven children, moved to uh, Lebanon. As it comes around, take a look at Aunt Edith there. And literally, she has a little, maybe it's a cable syrup bucket, but that is what she bring, brought her uh, lunch to school in. Uh, two others real quick. Uh, I don't know about the mild climate. Uh, in 1930, uh, there's a 1932 photograph here of my dad and my Aunt Edith. 
uh, with a sled on the frozen side of the Sandy Am River. And it's hard to tell how far out it's frozen. Um, must have been pretty cold. And then the last one uh, out of Dad's uh, uh, photo albums is his first grade picture uh, that was taken on the steps of the old, uh, old Lebanon Union High School here in 1923. And he wrote the names of the people, some of the spellings I'm suspect with, uh, but I suspect you may recognize some of those names. Uh, the reason I'm suspect of the spelling is uh, when the kids were at home, grandma never let them speak English. You spoke Czechoslovakian at home. And uh, I remember my Aunt Edith telling me that when she was walking with my dad on the way to school, dad's first day of school, first grade, uh, she said, you know, to my dad, uh, you know, they speak English at school. And dad said, well, yeah, I know that. And Edith said, well, do you know any English words? And dad said, well, yeah, I know the word damn it. <laughs> and of course, Edith said, uh, you know, the, probably got a shy away from it, probably got a shy away from using that. So anyway, to move on, I wanted to share those photos, but to move on, my dad was three years old when the family moved here. And after graduating from high school in 1935, uh, he moved to Portland where he worked in a sawmill with his brothers in Linton before being hired by the post office. And he had just passed the state civil service test and submitted his job application to the Portland Police Department when he was drafted into the uh, United States Army in 1942. So part of his training took him to Fort Hood, Texas, uh, back near his old roots. And knowing this, his folks encouraged him to uh, visit some family friends in nearby Temple, about an hour south of Waco. So dad did. Uh, this family had a 19-year-old daughter by the name of Lily, and by and by, dad and Lily uh, began dating and ended up being married before he went overseas. And uh, where, I'll say dad was a, a sergeant in the uh, 607th Tank Destroyer Battalion and was engaged in, uh, among other conflicts, the Battle of the Mets and the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and the Purple Heart was one of the several medals that he was awarded. And so after the war, he and Mom lived in Portland until 1951 when they decided they wanted to raise us kids in a little bit more rural setting. I remember him saying, uh, that when he returned to Portland after the war, that it just wasn't the same city. And I don't know all the implications of this, but uh, one of the things he said by bringing in the shipyards during World War II, that really changed the atmosphere of, of parts of the city, and they wanted to raise us down here. Uh, so October 1952, they bought our uh, Ash Street house on the corner of uh, Ash and Hyatt, the house in which I lived until I took off for college, and incidentally, which is Caddy Corner uh, from Linda and Robert's uh, home today. So I'd say, yeah, the Ball family members have been here now for almost 100 years, myself having lived away from here only nine years. So when Linda asked me if I'd make a brief presentation about family and growing up in Lebanon, I guess I should have expect that I'd be referred to on the flyer as, a, as an old timer. <laughs> Incidentally, a few other ball family uh, old timers are still in the area. My sister Betty Walls, uh, cousin Danny Suing, uh, second cousin Angie Hoffman. So to move on, as we're being asked to talk about growing up in Lebanon, I thought a few, uh, about a few different subjects. Uh, most that uh, are not unique to Lebanon, but I think really speak for the city. Uh, one topic that came to mind is the neighborhood hangouts. Uh, my brother Bernie and our neighbor Doug Alm and I, and some of the others after having big beans and berries in the day and delivering our paper routes, uh, we hung out at Booth Park. And on the warm summer evenings, we kind of cheat and move home, play a little bit closer to the fence by the canal. 
uh, and have a reason, so we'd have a reason to give our folks, uh, you know, when we got home, so we could say, well, Bernie or Doug or somebody had home run into the canal, and we had had to get in to retrieve the ball. So, so that's why we're in, that's why we're in the condition that we are. Um, another memory that crossed my mind uh, was the prevalence of neighborhood grocery stores. You know, that was before the age of uh, Plant Pantry, uh, Circle K, Dairy Mart, that type of thing. And the closest one to us was on the corner of uh, East Rose and William Street, uh, the Fields Market, some of you may remember. Uh, in the very late 50s and early 60s, Gus and Juanita Gunderson bought the Fields Grocer. And they lived catty corner from the market. Somehow, my brother Bertie and I found out Gus's birthday. Uh, I'd say at the time we were probably mm, late sixties, maybe early seventies or so. And so Bertie and I uh, bought like a thirty-nine cent Betty Crocker sheet cake, talked her mom into baking it and icing it and writing "Happy Birthday, Gundies," which is what we called him. Uh, and we brought it to him and. Uh, Clearly, he was overwhelmed, a couple little kids doing that. So not long after that, I acquired my Albany Democrat Herald paper route, which was in the area of the store. And in fact, the market was about halfway through my route. So most every day, I dropped in there for three musketeers, or I don't remember for a nickel, you get one that was as long as a ruler, it seemed like. And when I did, it seems like every couple weeks, Gundy refused my money, you know, uh, I guess, the continued thank you, you know, continuing thank you for the birthday. Uh, other places that real quick that came to mind included the freezer on Park Street, which was owned in the early, uh, until the early 80s by Oscar and Norma Crislin, best ice cream in town. He made it right there. Uh, stories about my paper route, one being chased in the era of no leash, the no leash laws. And just about daily, there's this huge German shepherd. And the way, we folded, the way we folded the paper square for that house, I'd get a rock and stick it inside the middle of the paper. Pedal as fast as I could down the middle of the street. Uh, and the, the rock to carry it, not to hit the dog. But he'll hurl that up toward the porch. And as soon as the noise hit the porch, man, I mean, here he came. Uh, did it like crazy, put your feet up on the, uh, you know, on the handlebars and hope that he tires out before my moment, before my moment uh, there were battles but uh, uh, I guess what I guess what I would add to that is uh, okay so I lost my place uh, must be the next page sorry um, so so only once I was uh, only once I was bitten and it wasn't by that German Shepherd uh, I guess I would call it a seemingly benign chihuahua <laughs> I was paying no, paying no attention to it. Just as and, you know, he did that. So, um, anyway, with all of that, though, I'd, li I'd like to take the last few minutes to address a subject that is unique to Lebanon uh, St. Edward Catholic School, which operated from the fall of 1955 until the spring of 1972. Uh, my dad was chair of the fundraising committee for uh, the new school, uh, which was built on a 4.5 acre lot southward, uh, just across the street from the current Boys and Girls, uh, Girls Club. And so that September, Portland, uh, Portland's Archbishop Edward D. Howard led the dedication ceremonies for the school. Uh, and then Mayor Ralph Scroggins uh, gave an address. So. In a couple weeks, uh, I think it was September 19, uh, classes started through uh, for grades one through four, and there were 125 students attending those uh, uh, attending those grades. Uh, three sisters from the Order of Saint Benedict, uh, or the Benedictine Order in Mount Angel, lived in a house near the church and taught the four grades uh, uh, at the Catholic school. So, in 57, 1957, grades five and six were added. Uh, grade seven was added in 1958, uh, grade eight in 1959. And a couple years later, the parish center was built in 1964 at a cost of 
$82,640, uh, including a kitchen, stage, basketball court. Uh, it served as a meeting place for a lot of the, a lot of the church clubs. So, in 1961, the school had an enrollment of 185, but the ensuing years uh, saw that decrease by 1972 by 43%, uh, only down to 104 uh, students. Part of that was tuition costs. Uh, sister Loretta was retiring. Uh, the other sister that was there, Regina Rausch, was being transferred to another school which left only lay teachers there in debate uh, among the school board and with the archdiocese, uh, ultimately, led, ultimately led to the school being closed after, uh, uh, at the end of the 1972 school year. Uh, the property then was bought by the Lebanon School District and eventually turned into their offices. And uh, I found the amount that they paid for the 4.5 acre lot uh, in the buildings in 1972, $220,000. Uh, so, uh, get toward the end here. Uh, St. Edward's uh, brings up memories from the lighter side, I guess I could say. Uh, I was in the eighth grade when the parish center was built. So in addition to the school now having a basketball team, three cheerleaders, we eighth graders participated in the first team dance held in the building. And uh, when I thought about that, I thought maybe I should say kind of participated in the dance. Uh, someone brought a stereo and a number of us brought records, the Kings, Dave Clark Five, the Beatles and all of that. Uh, and, we kind of ended up doing what teens did at teen dances at that time. Uh, all the girls stood on one end of the gym in a small group talking. Uh, all of the guys stood in another group at the other end, kind of poking and jabbing and talking and joking with each other. And the mob of chaperones, I, I wish I'd have counted. I suspect there may have been more chaperones than there were us, kept encouraging us to dance. And when we didn't, I remember Doug Ohm's mom uh, and my mom, uh, left and came back with, oh, some record albums, uh, sing along with Mitch, Lawrence Well, and so on. And so I was trying to figure out how to put it. Uh, I guess I would say that evening there was more waltzing than there was twisting. Uh, <laughs> it, it, um, one more note about the school uh, that I kind of interest. Several years ago when I wrote a couple of pieces for the Lebanon Express, uh, I recalled something about a time capsule, I'm thinking, maybe placed behind the 1955 cornerstone, uh, which still appears on the front, uh, front porch of the building. And so at that time, I asked a few people who attended St. Edward's if they had any re recollection of that. Most didn't. Uh, and I remember a couple saying, well, yeah, we kind of do. And so, you know, my thoughts, it'd be interesting to see if anyone from uh, St. Edward's Parish or the school uh, has any memory of that. Might be some, you know, might be something interesting to look into. So, uh, one, one one more story. At the end of our eighth grade year, uh, at the end of our eighth grade year, graduation and all, our class was putting together a memory book, uh, nominating and voting on class colors, class motto, flower, and all of that. You know, when it came to the class song, the winner was uh, one of the Beatles' uh, most recent releases, a song called P.S. I Love You. And that one, and I recall Sister Loretta saying that this song might not be a real good choice because in six months, most likely we wouldn't even remember who the Beatles were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bless her heart. No, you know, had she said that about, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the other people we listened to on, as Charlie Eats here would have listened to on K. Gallier, Pal, the Mighty 92, or the Bobby Sox and Blue Jeans, she probably would have been right. So, so to pull it all together here, uh, you know, to me, Lebanon clearly has both a rich, unique history, uh, including St. Edward's. You know, a somewhat universal history with the neighborhood hangouts, uh, the corner markets, crop picking, paper routes, 
all of those which you know could be great stories in themselves so anyway with all this i've got to say i'm excited about uh, the progress lebanon museum committee and city council are making toward developing uh, the long overdue lebanon museum and i'm looking forward to seeing it all come together thank you Secretary and President Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln. Fort Dix, New Jersey is named after him. I myself was stationed at Fort Dix for a short time in 1959, and when the post commanding general, his name was MacArthur Ike Pershing, found out about my ancestry, several parades were held in my honor, and many medals were bestowed upon me. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I was stationed there before my transit to Fontainebleau, France, and Governor John Dix really was my great great grandfather. So, anyway, now my folks are newly married and living in their first house that looked like a sea shanty on Third Street, known as the Dr. Whelan Cottage. He was a local dentist, now sadly replaced by a cookie cutter house. Then they moved to an adobe Spanish house, the other place on West Grand Street, and it's still there. This was my first home ever. There was one more stop before East Sherman Street, the house at the corner of Park and West Ash Streets. It is still there, in excellent condition. From there we moved to 549 East Sherman Street, where my life really began. Photography always played a big part in our family's lives. We had a dark room in the basement of a house, and of course there was a larger, better equipped dark room at the newspaper, the Lebanon Express. In Oregon, there was a blue law, and here's a little bit as to what Wikipedia has to say about it. The Oregon black exclusion laws were attempts to prevent black people from settling within the borders of the settlement and eventual U.S. state of Oregon. The first such law took effect in 1844, when the Provisional Government of Oregon voted to exclude all black settlers from Oregon's borders. The law authorized a punishment for any black settler remaining in the territory to be whipped with not less than 20 or more than 39 strikes for every six months they remained. Additional laws aimed at African Americans entering Oregon were ratified in 1849 and 1857. The last of these laws were killed in 1926. Uh, the laws born of anti-slavery and anti-black police were often justified as a reaction to fears of blacks instigating Native American uprising. My meager understanding of the law was that a black person could not spend the night in Lebanon. Over the years, many black entertainers came to town to perform at the Arts Lodge and other organizations, including Melody Lane, the one nightclub out Highway 20 for a sweet home. The building is still there. Once a black fellow came to Lebanon, and he was the principal speaker in the Chamber of Commerce. He was president of the highly esteemed Urban League of Portland. After the event was over and the guy was preparing to drive back to Portland, my parents invited him to be their guest for the night, as the weather was terrible, gusty winds and relentless rains, and so he did. We all stayed up late that evening, listening to his stories of traveling around the world. He later sent me a book by Ralph Bunch, the United Nations Secretary. I'm so sorry you have forgotten his name. Some people in Lebanon were not too happy with my folks hosting a black person overnight. Two or three businessmen actually pulled their advertising for a few issues. I think, though, that the first black person I ever saw was a maid traveling with some rich relatives. They were driving up to Tacoma from Southern California and stopped to business, visit us for a day or so. She was very personable, and we took to each other right away. I think now that she was a feminine personification of Uncle Remus, as she had marvelous stories to tell, especially about her roots in the South. I don't believe until I saw her that I knew black people existed. Growing up with newspaper people was an education, maybe even more so in a small town. A newspaper like Dad owned was a starting point for many young journalists just beginning their careers. 
One could see how the entire newspaper was put together. There was no isolation between departments. Because my dad was usually an officer in the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association, the OAPA, and the close approximation to the School of Journalism at the University of Oregon in Eugene, many young journalism students were sent to the Express over the years to learn firsthand how newspaper really works, or in other words, to get printer's ink on those hands, and to even see how the paper got into the homes of the subscribers. This was all really exciting for me when these students visited the paper, as they seemed so cosmopolitan to me, yet eager to learn. The young students would spend a couple of weeks in London, driving back and forth to Eugene each day. On the last day, the folks had been invited into the house for conversation and drinks. I was still only in high school and not allowed alcoholic beverage, but I would carefully sneak one or two to bring me up to their level of conversation, or so I thought. Speaking of booze, at around the age of 12, a neighborhood lad and myself raided his dad's liquor cabinet and got terribly drunk. As a consequence, the next morning I had a terrible hangover, which I could not hide from my parents. Mercifully, they let me sleep it off that day. But the next morning I found myself melting lead in the back shop. The folks thought, I suppose, that this was punishment for my sins, as it was summer, and so long the bike riding and everything else summer entailed. The thing is, though, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Printing is an involved process, so I won't get into it here, but most of the lead used for each issue of the paper from the type study is recycled. The ink is removed using gasoline soap rags, and in a spent type, it's thrown into a large cauldron heated by gas jets underneath it. When it's all liquefied, it's sort of a lead soup that arch villains can drink. With a steel ladle, I would pour the lead into cast iron bowls, and when they were cooled off and hard, I would take them to the linotype and inner type machines, and they were remelted to make type. So I did this for several summers and after school. It also helped out the circulation department, pulling a little red wagon through town with the newspapers, taking the most recent paper into the store and collecting any that hadn't been sold. Now, I got to go into the taverns with these papers. <laughs> and the tavern, I think it was the past time, was across the street from that hamburger place, across from where the old bank building is. And they had mad magazines in there, and they had all the war and tales from the crypt, and true suspense stories and scientific something or other. No other place in town had these magazines and these funny books. And they were good. They were well drawn. And they had good storylines. And the guy, the, the bartender, let me buy them. So that I had kids come over to the house begging to read them. They had to just get that really nice to me. <laughs> but anyway, so I had this red wag and I had to keep my eye on, eye on it. Otherwise, older kids would steal the wagon and hide it from me. So in the early 1950s, my folks and I knew something that no other soul in town knew. A former member of Hitler's Youth Corps was in Lebanon, roaming the streets, welcomed into homes, stores, and even some churches. Well, yes, and his name was Wolfgang Meyer, and he was a Fulbright scholar studying journalism at the University of Oregon, and he was assigned as part of his studies to spend time at the Express, learning how Americans produced their newspapers. Wolf was great. He never disguised the fact that he was fighting the war for Germany against America. Thus, he did, however, as time went on, discover that Hitler was insane and not only a danger to the entire world, but Germany as well. One of his duties was to carry and load shells from a huge 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. I'm not sure if that this 88 millimeter, this FMB millimeter, I don't know. Anyway, he was 15 when he joined the Youth Corps, and he never joined the Nazi Party. After I got out of the Army, stationed in Munich, I stayed in Europe a year, and I went to visit Wolf in Saarbrück in Germany, where he was military editor, affairs editor for the large daily newspaper there. 
In his office behind his desk and on the wall was a large flag of the state of Oregon that some officials in Salem had given him. When I was in the Army in Munich, I was a photojournalist in a truck and armored personnel battalion of the 24th Infantry Division. A few months before my discharge, I was very fortunate to be visited by good family friends from uh, London, Dick and Alan Carlson. There's their granddaughter right there. <laughs> and she was just too young to join us at the time because we went into the world's largest beer hall in, in the world. I wasn't born yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Hofbrauhaus, the world's largest beer house. They were touring Europe in the rented car, and I was happy to show them around Munich. I would say the highlight of our time was just drinking beer and talking with them, the Hofbrauhaus, catching up with affairs in Lebanon. Stein's beer with one, or one liter and cost a little bit more than 20 cents. And it's just no wonder GIs love Germany. <laughs> so I was on my best behavior with Carlson since I was sure my folks would be expecting a first hand report. It was really good to see friendly faces in my hometown. I had been away for a little over two years. I like to backtrack here a number of years. My folks knew quite a few newspaper publishers throughout the state, in particular the smaller papers, the weeklies and bi weeklies. Many weekends, these publishers and their families would gather in our own two story bungalow on Sherman Street, three bedrooms on the second floor, minus the bathroom. Sometimes two or three families would be staying with the dad, dad turned the bathroom schedule on the job press of the newspaper. He gave himself 15 minutes and everyone else got five. <laughs> One family in particular would be Eric Allen from Bedford. Eric's father, Eric Sr., founded the School of Journalism at the U of O, one of the finest in the country. Allen Hall, that houses the J School, is named after him. There was a wee bit of drinking that went on. Eric Jr. would get under my parents' bed and arrange the fringe of the bedspread so they covered all of his face, except his nose and eye. This is just all you could see of it. We kids would run into the bedroom and just laugh and howl while the adults would bring in drinks. We'd just laugh and howl at this crazy guy, and that was all you could see of him. Later, Eric Allen served on the Pulitzer Prize Board for journalism. Running a small town newspaper was tough, especially when the big press broke down in the middle of the run. Very fortunately, Hillsboro had a goss press exactly like ours. Dave Hatton, the other apprentice, and I would load the heavy eight pages into a rented truck and take off north to Hillsboro. The pages were heavy because the steel frame held around 100 pounds of lead type. And yes, once the front page is dropped on the story of the press and the holy jumble of lead on the floor had to be assembled and reassembled and many proofs made until there was an order. We didn't get back from Hillsborough until after midnight. And if this was Thursday's paper, the circulation crew would be called in to insert the two or three sections into the main one. Then the papers would be run through the address graph for each and every subscriber in town or county by Terry McCann, the pressman's wife. Terry was chief of the circulation department and looked pretty much like Jennifer Lola Brigida. She didn't dress like her though, which was a good thing as there were newspaper carriers hanging around. Dad got his newspaper start in Tacoma with the neighborhood mediograph publication, the D Street News. When he was still in Tacoma, he wrote a regular ski column for the Tacoma News Tribune. He was an excellent skier, and he and the druggist, Terry Miller, <coughs> were the first skiers to ski in the area that would become Kudu Ski Bowl. Dad petitioned the government to put rope, rope toes in the bowl, and they did. He was the first secretary of the town's chamber of commerce, and then paid. Shortly thereafter, John Crosby became the first chamber manager, and he rented an apartment above our garage from us. John was a professor of geology later on at Preston State. The great photographer, Ansel Adams' son, was a student of his. That could be why one of Adams' original sign prints is next to one of my sign prints in John's study. Thank you very much. It could be that because Dad was publisher of the local paper and that we had a nice, new, and fancy house, 
the first front level house in Lebanon and the first sliding glass doors in town. Michael sold them in Southern California and gave us a good deal. <laughs> anyway, over the years, a lot of big weeks came to our house with drinks and appetizers, sometimes before a chamber of commerce banquet, something like that. Senators and governors and industrials like Mr. Zellerback of Crown Zellerback Mill came to our house. Governor and then Senator Mark Hatfield, U.S. Senator Richard Newberg, as you may recall, when he died, his wife succeeded him. It was said around town that when Governor Paul Patterson stopped by for drinks and snacks, that when he died the next day, he had to get something to pay him to serve. That's a small town for you. On May 8, 1945, the world celebrated BB Day, victory in Europe. The war in Europe was over. Germany had surrendered to the Allies. As it was a Wednesday and not a press day, Dad put out a thin special edition with huge headlines on the front page. The express building was at the corner of 2nd and West Sherman Streets, a block from Main Street. Hundreds of happy people were gathering at Main and Sherman around London's once classic bank buildings to celebrate the Nazi surrender. As I recall, it was a sunny day and I had just turned six in April and had not yet started school. My folks thought it would be a good idea to learn about business and mingle with people. Today, I would have been kidnapped. <laughs> anyway, someone put a carrier's bag over my shoulder, put a few newspapers in it, caught off the press, and gently shoved me toward Main Street. With a little change, nickels and dimes. I got to the corner and following directions, held up a paper as high as I could and yelled, War over! War over! Germany quit! <laughs> the yelling or screaming didn't do much to it. There were so many people until some big fellow scooped me up and held me high and said, Now yell, kid, yell it loud. And I did, even louder than this guy's shoulders. I ran out of papers and my hands were full of dollar bills in exchange. I went back to the paper to get more paper several times, and sometimes people followed me back to the office to get their own papers. I tell you, every time I go by that corner, I think of that day another time as an eighth grader, and on a Saturday morning, I was downtown, and I saw Keith Richards lounging at the same corner, so I stopped and joined him. He was sort of the hero of mine, a big senior and football player. I think I was in the eighth grade. So we were gabbing. Keith was always very polite. His brother John and his wife Helen ran Strawberry City Coffee Shop for many years on Main Street across from the Legion. So we were gabbing, and as time passed, more kids joined us until we were filling out into the street. Keith did very well for himself. He retired as chief archivist from the University of Oregon a few years ago. Maybe now, when each of you go by the corner of Main West and West Sherman Street, you'll know that things happened there. Yes, I grew up in Lebanon. We grew up in Lebanon. And thank God for it. Once I lived in San Francisco and sought a respite from the crazy, <coughs> so I went to a beach north of the city. Camping out in the wilderness for a few days cleared my head. Excuse me. An unbidden thought came to me, sort of a deep and yet apart from my own brain. Quite simply, I was informed or told how fortunate that I was born in the little town of Lebanon and nowhere else in the entire world. So thank you all for this opportunity and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one thing. This is the master of the Lebanon Express. Oh. Count yeah. Cool. Count is count papers passed over that. Let's have a is it on? I turned it off. Let's have a round of applause for all three of us. <laughs> I have two other announcements to make before uh, we take some questions and comments. Um, first, there's a beautiful platter of cookies back there. Uh, Sue Spiker made those for us, so feel free to get up and have some cookies and water and lemonade. And second, we'll have another program on June 12th, and it will feature Betty and Bob 
Adams talking about the Adams Pharmacy, which used to be on Main Street, underneath the Masonic Lodge, the Donica Building. And uh, they'll talk about their years there and show you things that they inherited with that business because uh, there had been a pharmacy continu continuously in that building or the one next door since the 1880s. That will be June 12th at the lobby at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. Does anybody have a uh, question? Hey, one more thing. Uh, I forgot to hold this up. Does anybody not know who HST is? There you go, yes. He didn't make it, he didn't come, but they thought but he, he planned to. <laughs> And that's a, this is a special edition. It's not for us today. Question or comment from anybody? I'm the youngster. You're I, of all the oldsters, I'm the youngster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. You're up. <laughs> yeah. How can everybody hold up their hands if they've ever gone to uh, Adams Pharmacy for anything? Okay, would you hold up your hand if you if you ever went to Adams Pharmacy? Oh, they have the best macaroni salad. Oh no, the best roast beef salad. Yes, you remember. That. <laughs> you don't want the recipe. Okay, Ken saying that he has copies of two articles from the Lebanon Express. One or they both Lebanon Express? Uh, yeah, both Lebanon Express. Uh, one is a piece I did uh, several years ago about uh, the culture out of the theme and very fields. Uh, and then the second one is some additional information on. St. Edward's Catholic School. So hear that? there's copies if any of you would like to take. Thank you. You didn't hear? Okay, one of the articles is about St. Edward's Catholic School. The other is about picking berries and beans as a kid. And Ken wrote both those stories. He's got copies here that you can take. Can I get a uh, we've got a uh, couple of things here. Um, what? Paper mask head is still making its way around. Okay. Uh, and I have to put a, a, a spiel in to uh, as we go along with these hands. Do remember that's the kind of stuff that's critical to hold on to and give to us eventually. That was Tawny, our, our collections person. Yeah. What did she say? Oh, she said uh, that things like that masthead are critical to hold on to and eventually to give to the museum because people in the future will be really excited to see that. Was there something when somebody here wanted to say? No? Well, I, I guess we're done then. Um, maybe we could have one more. Oh, sorry. I can recall. Um, I heard that there were like 54 sawmills along uh, the railroad tracks. Uh, Harold Grove told me one time. Does anybody know if that was the right number or how many of those sawmills were in Lebanon? Yeah, did we actually have 54 sawmills? It's very possible. Did you all hear that? 